evening and welcome to Information Please, your Peoria Public Library on the air, bring you information about your library and your community. And this evening my guest is Norm Kelly, who's our, one of our great local authors and historians. Last week, if you missed that show, we talked about his fiction writing, which isn't as well known. But tonight we're going to talk about, delve into some old cases, some of the most famous murders in Peoria. And these are from the pages of history, and I think most Purians have never heard of them unless you've been privileged to read Norm's articles on them. But they're fascinating. They bleed over into ghost stories, and so we're going to talk about that tonight. Hi, Norm. Hi, how are you? Fine. Gla thank you for coming and letting me uh, probe into your vast knowledge of the terrible things that yeah. happened in Peoria. <laughs> you better hurry up because it's slipping away. <laughs> oh, it is not. <laughs> um, we're going to talk about First of all, two murders that are tied together because of the fact that the murderers died in the same electric chair. That's something, isn't it? Yeah, it is, which, um, at Joliet. Oh, yeah. That's which, right. of course, you know, the Blues Brothers movies, you know, made fun of that whole Chicago yeah. Joliet prison thing, but mm -hmm. it was a very, very real thing. Before we started, we had eight other murders that they were all executed in Peoria. Really? All one of them out, two of them in the prairie, out in the prairie, and the other six in our gallows within the courthouse, one of them outside. Wow. And that's a book in your library. It's called Until You Are Dead, because that's what the judge said to every person that came before him oh, yeah. uh, in a capital crime. So if you really want to read that, Were all incredible. Of those incredible. Hangings? Yeah, and two of them out on the prairie. At what point were they hanging people out on the prairie? 1850, way 1850. down by before second before the Civil War. Absolutely, Second and Fisher was just a massive prairie. Our population was around 6,600 in the city limits, which mm -hmm. is really little, barely little. Over yeah, it was a tiny square. little place in and 1850. so about 15, 16,000 people, according to the reports, uh, came to the scene. And this dual hanging, uh, exciting and, and unbelievable true stories in our own hometown. Really yeah, were. And, and people just don't even know. Well, they know. should follow me in the library. They should. They That's should. Um, well, we've got the two guys that ended up in the same electric chair in Joliet were about 10 years apart, though. Mm -hmm. And the earlier one is really pretty frightening. And you think... Yeah. This, this leads you to say there's nothing new under the sun because this uh -huh. guy was a serial killer. Uh, and a serial. A no, serial rapist. A rapist. Did he only kill yes. one person? Yes. But he was a serial rapist. Yes, yeah, right. Of and course, nobody is, knew that. No, and when, this is back nobody. in the days when women wouldn't dare tell anyone they had been raped. This was because a, it's true. It was their fault. They would be shamed. They would lose everything. You got it right on the head. And this was 1935. I'm three years old, so don't blame me for this murder. <laughs> and, and it was a shocking uh, event. And, and his name was Gerald Thompson. He was yeah. uh, all of 25 years old. My mother-in-law had a crush on him. Really? He played in, in my wife's uncle's band called the, the uh, Illinois Cowboys. Oh, we he should look was. for a picture of them. I got them all. Oh, do, you, I, yeah, do you have oh, a picture of the Illinois oh, Cowboys? I think, oh, I think I do, but you don't want to come in this room and where I have all my stuff. You can't find it. Oh, that. we need to scan that for the library because everybody okay. wants to see and that. So Gerald Thompson played in the Illinois Cowboys. Yeah, it's just a, just just a, a bar, bar thing. Yeah, bar band. Yes, and Gerald Thompson was a caterpillar guy, well-liked, moved into his grandparents' home to take care of them and pay for everything. He brought candy home to the kids. Uh, he fixed radios. He was a very, very nice guy. And Seemed like very, a pillar of the community. And he was very good looking, too. And this man uh, had a thing, a dark thing that he did. And he had no trouble asking ladies out, and they all said yes. It isn't like he stalked them, Teresa, and knocked them down or stabbed yeah. them. I guess today they call it something like date rape. Yeah, date something rape. Something like that, but it was still rape. Sure. And he kept a diary. And I really researched this book, spent a whole year. It was the best thing I ever did, and had an agent from New York. 
And I thought, hey, I'm not long for El Vista. Well, I'm gone out of here. <laughs> well, none of that happened, but I still have the book. If you want to print it, call me up and we'll do it. But you this need an was e-book. Like, it, it, it's just incredible. And he would just work like everybody else, and he went over to the tower in the heights, and that's where he met a lot of his girls. He had a, a little car, a cabriolet, a little convertible. Well, the rumor is that the passenger side handle was broken, which is true, but not in the car he used when he picked up Mildred Hallmark. And that was a very uh, essential thing in the book. Yeah, and And Mildred Hallmark was only 19 years old. Beautiful girl. Went to mass every day. Mm -hmm. And she was a graduate of our academy uh uh, academy for... Yeah, Academy of Our Lady, yeah, sorry. I, I won't tell it's you It's been exactly. closed long enough that I forgot yeah. the name. <laughs> I won't tell you exactly, but she lived on East Maywood. And uh, I used to, I would take people to the scene of the, her house and the, never mind any of that stuff. But the point is, she was just a dream girl. Engaged, yeah. lovely lady, everybody liked her. She had a job at Bishop's. At and, Bishop's uh, Cafeteria, mm-hmm, a one, concept that's long gone. Yeah, I think like June 16th, it was raining. She said goodbye to a, a boy, not her, fr- not her boyfriend, just a yeah. friend, and jumped on this streetcar. To come to find out, though, it was going to stop four blocks, maybe five blocks from her house. The conductor must have, and I can't find this for sure, must have said, well, there's a, a one coming right behind me. You can just get off uh, over mm-hmm. on Pennsylvania when I turn and get on it, and it'll stop right in front of your house. That's a, kind of guessing because who would really know? Yeah, Think nobody about it. would know. Uh, all the evidence, is, and so she did. She stopped. Did she get yeah. on? Does anybody know? Did she get on the wrong streetcar? No, no. no she she, just... she wanted out of the rain, and she was going to get on the streetcar. Because, but I don't. There, there's no. So it was just she got on the first streetcar that came. That was, it was going her rain. way. Going and her that direction. was her death sentence. And I think people now don't understand, you know, the whole concept of. You don't all have a car and can get in it and go. That streetcar gets sort of where you're going and then get the rest of the way. Absolutely. I loved them. But anyway, so when she, I think this would be like June 16th, 1935. Mm -hmm. And the streetcar stopped at Manius Manor, Pennsylvania, Knoxville, building still there. And she got off, expecting then within moments. uh, Another streetcar. It apparently didn't come. Manius, Mr. Manius saw what I'm going to tell you. He looked out and he saw this man standing, Mm -hmm. talking to this lady. And then they both walked around and he opened the door and she got in. We actually have an eyewitness to that. That saw that she voluntarily got in his car. Absolutely. Why she's smarter than that, who knows. But poor thing. But if he was good looking, he's charming. And he said, I live right out by you, which he didn't. Yeah. And then when he then drove, turned left on Prospect and went up to the Heights, he was looking for a place to park, you know, Lover's Lane thing type thing. Yeah, Lover's Lane type. But um, Mildred would have none of that. And Mm -hmm. and, uh, how we know what she said if we believe what he told us. And he made a confession to the jur- uh, to the trial mm-hmm. judge without the jury. So I know exactly what he said he said. What he said, said to the judge. Said, exactly. All that is in the book. And uh, I just, my heart beating when I read it because it was unbelievable. And then, of course, Mildred's parents, who live very close to Springdale Cemetery. Right. Uh, waiting, waiting, calling, doing, crying, whatever people do. Can you imagine? And I know exactly what they did because they told us. And uh, she didn't come home. And then finally, about 7 in the morning, this black car pulled up in front of their house. And, of course, the coroner and the sheriff told them. Yeah, that she had been murdered. That was the massive headlines, extra. My mother-in-law actually was uh, going to have a baby well, it might have been my wife, or I don't know, or maybe her brother. But anyway, uh, and she was in the hospital when she heard the news, too. 
wow. uh, on the extra because they went all Well, and it's time. not even just, it wasn't even just a local story. It was a oh, national story because if absolutely. you use the, you know, we've got the newspapers, newspaper collection online at the library, yeah. which if you have your library card and your PIN number, you can sit at home in your pajamas and look this stuff up, go in newspapers. But you can actually see newspapers from 1935, the front pages that have this headline. I about, think that's why I'm blind, because yeah, I, did, <laughs> I, I did it for 32 years. Yeah. Uh, and, and then uh, uh, when the headlines came and the tragedy and the, all the sadness, you, just, you know all those, but I, I really did list it. Well, and you, you know. think about the difference today. Young women disappear all the time I still. Know. But now they're tracing the cell phone signal, mm -hmm. and they're, where's their car? And they still, you know, somebody disappears, and their cell phone is found in a trash can somewhere, or s smashed on the side of the road, or, you know, somebody else is using it, and they don't find the car for days. So I'm not sure we've gotten much better than in, in the days I when you know. had to, your one phone line at yeah. home. And I won't get into any de this gory details no, of this what is, happened this to is her. Television. Yeah. But at any rate, then he then turned left into Springdale Cemetery rather than right on Maywood and took her right down across the bridge. And there, of course, you know, he attempted to kiss her. And, and um, when all this, uh, she rebelled on screaming and, and he bit his thumb. Uh, too bad we didn't have forensics then. And yeah. DNA. But none of that is there, folks. And, and he hit her. Uh, well, it's kind of like an uppercut, and it, it actually did break her neck. And that's actually what killed her. So he probably yeah. didn't intend to kill her. Absolutely, which is not a capital crime, which means we should not have executed, but that's a whole lecture that I give later, some yeah. other. But at any rate, then he, uh, her clothing was off, and he decided, well, I'll just take her down the bridge and throw her off the bridge. She's lying in the And back you're talking seat. about the bridge in Springdale Cemetery. No, well, yeah, there is yeah. one there. But this, no, he was going to throw her in the bridge downtown. Oh, okay, he was going to throw her into the Illinois River. Yeah, and let, let the people in New Orleans worry about her, I guess. But anyway, that, that's what, when he got up there and ready to make his turn, he just thought, oh, wow, what if police stopped me or something. So he took her back down, went over the little bridge you just mentioned, right. and then just simply opened to pull up to the creek uh, and kind of a lot of water mm -hmm. and a, a tree that had fallen over and he started throwing the clothes out and then he just took her and threw her out. And uh, a description of it will haunt you, so we yeah, won't talk about that. Yeah, it's very sad. And then later on, then a man, uh, you know. But she was wearing a white dress with polka dots, yes. I understand. And I have a picture of those. Yeah. I have a pictures of But the white these. dress is important later on. It is. <laughs> and then, of course, who did it? Yeah. And the massive people they arrested and picked up and everything. And, and uh, finally, uh, they're, they're her, her brothers, her two, her two brothers uh, were tipped off by a lady that had been raped by him. Oh, so somebody finally came That's forward right. and said. No, not yet. They no. took the ball bat first. Oh. And they found... Uh, Thompson, it would be a whole different murder situation. Mm -hmm. Thank God they didn't because it would have destroyed their lives. Right. And finally, the one tip from one of the rapists, that's the one. And then at, uh, five or six days later, they arrest him at work. He's on third shift. And the sensation of it all. Then we violated his rights. Uh, I mean, that what, happened back then. Well, at 26 hours, they interviewed him. That's a nice word. Uh, up in uh, City Hall. Mm -hmm. And down there in the street was, they estimated over a thousand people. Really? Just standing, milling around by Sacred Heart, is that it? Yeah, Sacred Heart Cathedral. And uh, finally, they uh, turned on all lights except one light on him, and they begin to take her clothing and reach over and dropped it one by one in his lap. And uh, he finally admitted it, and the cop walks over and he yells out. He did it. He admitted he did it, and a big roar. Well, the trial was was the most sensational thing Pierre had seen for a oh, long yeah. time. Mm -hmm. And I make a major point out of 95. The, one reporter said that's probably 98% of the people who came to see it were women. He, they, this guy fascinated them. 
coming from the jail, he would gauntlet, they'd walk mm -hmm. this gauntlet. By the way, there is a tunnel underneath there too, because I was in it. But anyway, this is sensational. Well, yeah, you know, people, and, and you know. it fascinates me too that this murder was um, on June sixteenth, nineteen thirty-five, oh. and already July twenty-second. Absolutely, they're trying. They move fast back and, then. And None and of this. And it was really well. Shilly shallying around. Yeah, the ladies actually tore off some of the side thing on the door. You know, the rim, because they really wanted to see this and. And it was a hot day, and it really is. So I really get into every word that was said. And then, uh, of course, he, his, his attorney said the, it, it was coerced. And, and of course yeah. it was. Yeah. And uh, violated all his rights. But anyway, they tried him. They found him guilty. Appeals came and went. And he was in, of course, quickly taken up the Juliet, put on death row. And Mr. Um, Hallmark, uh, some pathetic quotes from him, and, and oh, he actually yeah. saw it, and so forth. And then uh, very shortly after that, I don't remember the date, uh, but very shortly, I, uh, they uh, actually electrocuted him in what they call old, old Smokey up at Yeah, Joliet. October 15th, 1935. There you so go. Think of it. That, that just doesn't happen now. Right, you right. don't have a murder at the end of June and executed by the middle of October. Now you're in there 18, 19 years, and, or then Before they stop they... the death penalty. As you can see, I'm absolutely for the death penalty. Mm -hmm. In every book I ever wrote, I wrote 235 murder cases. I've written about them. And uh, the last one I wrote was Murder in Your Own Backyard. I suggest you don't read the book. It is factual, terrifying, and the mere fact that the title says Murder in Your Own Backyard. Yeah. Really, that is on. It's in the library, and you're welcome to read it. But uh, I wouldn't read it alone. <laughs> <laughs> and keep the lights on and the door locked. And I don't pull any punches. This is yeah. like an R-rated book, so folks, it isn't the language. No, it's just the actual what the, human beings are capable of doing to other human it's beings. Horrifying. It is. It is. It is. So that really ended him, and I very fortunately uh, spoke to eight, maybe 12 people, and their, their stories are in the book. One's a transcribed one, two of them, one from my mother-in-law and one from... And then when I went down to Springfield, I copied the uh, testimony that he gave when the jury wasn't in. Right. And then there's a the little black book. Had I had that in my hand, you'd have to come and see me in Jamaica. Because that's, had I... But we don't know for sure, but we know the judge had it. Had the little black book, but nobody knows. Maybe what he just after that. righteously burned it up. I don't know, but he named names and oh man. He had he actually wrote down the details of his crime, so that is did. what did him in. And and yeah. I'm telling you, uh, people that knew him said, "No way, that you know he couldn't have done this." And his grandmother. Well, think about how many people who are horrible, twisted criminals are just, you know, pleasant people Plain on the outside. Guys. You have no idea. But he's he's not buried here. He's buried in Macomb. He moved, uh, he was buried next to his grandfather, who was a Civil War hero. Oh, dear. And a lot of people really didn't like that. He probably would rather that that descendant yeah. not be I there. I wouldn't want him next to me. No, no. <laughs> but, who would want that guy? But, you know, that book is sitting in my closet, I think about 349 words or something. And uh, I have photographs. I got them and then converted. The library were very kind to me. They gave me, can you imagine? They gave me the, the fish, is that what they call it? The, oh, the micro. Yeah, micro oh, pictures, mm -hmm. photo, I got photographs of everything, him, oh. her, and everything. And then I had them made into a negative, and then they were going to go in the book. Mm. I wonder uh, if I went to print it, if I could find the photos I doubt it. But I could do it all over again. I don't want to, and I'm not going to. Well, anybody can always check with our local history department and see what photos we have. Absolutely. It's oh, amazing. They've, they've helped me have. so much. Yeah, started. we have a great staff there, and people don't realize that yeah. it's all free. You come in, you get the answers you want, whether it's you're building a business, you want to know what was there first, yes. or you want to know family history, or like you, you're you know researching something specific. Go in there and ask for Amber or... Or Deb, or, or Joe, or Chris, yeah. and just say, Norm told me you'd help me. Yeah. You tell them that, and, and believe me, yeah. they're only doing it because they know me, right? <laughs> yeah. 
No, no they're no. wonderful people, and they will go to they have all a passion. Ends. They, they have do. a passion for the past, and they have a passion for helping people, That's and, right. which is what makes it such a great thing. Ever, absolutely. Well, um, a little more than 10 years later, there was another horrible murder, which this one just makes no sense to me, because it sounds mm -hmm. like the murderer was just some random guy that... You in know, your own backyard? What the, so, what the heck are you doing? That's right. Flavel Figer. Figer. It's F-E-U. It's spelled yeah. funny. Well, it's, I think it's a French name. Is it? Figer, yeah. Flavel Figer. And, and um, um, Mavis, what was her name? Um, Maybe Mavis we, Bishop. There you go. I'm amazed. She related I can to remember. Bishop Cafe, Cafeteria? No, she worked there. Oh, she did. <laughs> Even though her name was, but everybody worked there. I apparently, know. it was a neat place. It had electronic doors, and we used to go down and watch them. <laughs> That's truthful. <laughs> but you know, Flavel uh, just got out of the Navy, mm -hmm. and good looking, money. Dad owned a, a, a jewelry store. Wonderful family, and Mavis just, just again, just like yeah. um, Hallmark, just such neat people, yeah. and. He had a 1947 Pontiac, brand new, yeah, brand, brand new. new. Not and he was going a, to Bradley. That's right. And he's a, a Bradley sophomore. student, probably going on the GI Bill. Yeah, he sure was. And I did the same thing then in '55. Mm -hmm. um, so did my dad. I'll be darned. Mm -hmm. And and it was a perfect life. Mm -hmm. And uh, he pulled up his car. They had Christmas things up. He had the window down. It was kind of a mild December night. And he. Uh, stopped at Franklin and somewhere down there and if somebody opened the door and said, uh, whoops, I just broke, did I break it? No, it's and, fine. And he, he opened the door and said, will you take me to the airport? And the man who, who was standing there was in a pea coat. Well, the veteran owned the car. You think he was going to say no to this guy? No. And he did. Veterans and don't do that. That's right. And he drove him out the airport and during the conversation, um, the killer a pull, pulled out a small gun, a 25 caliber pistol that he'd taken from a woman that he'd raped the night before. So and, this guy was know, all over the place. Car yes, thief, gun yes, thief, you rapist, yeah, murderer. And, 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 and he was, a, he again, a wonderful guy. Everybody really liked him. Uh, Not the murderer, they no, liked flavor. Yeah. And, and, oh yeah, uh, oh the murderer too. He was a just an ordinary guy. Hmm. Uh, but you know what he was? He was in the business of stealing cars, and all he wanted was the car. Flavel, being an ex-GI and used to roughhousing, I'm sure, uh, according to the confession of the killer, uh, lunged at him, and he said it accidentally went off three times. Well, maybe. Three times. Accidentally went off. He put times. the body in the trunk, drove it around for a couple of days, the whole... Peoria, Bradley, you name it, looking for the car. Then you know, a Bradley student finally found the car, and when they opened it up, inside the glove compartment was a motorcycle cap in the old oh, days. Okay. And inside, it uh, said her name, and I can't remember her name. Um, yeah, it was, let's see, Norma Weber. The Why? cap said normal well, weather. Well, see, that inside. shows I'm getting old because I would have known that any. And, and that's it. They ran down Norma, and, and uh, she said her husband was in Texas. I remember the town, Conroy, Texas. Yeah, he went to Conroy, Texas. And that's where they went down and picked him up and brought him on back, and he confessed three times. <laughs> so they had all these confessions, and they really were interested in only one thing where's the body? And he said, oh, it's probably down in. New Orleans or somewhere. And then later on, a guy named Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T. Mm -hmm. He came forth and he told them what he knew and down went a group of 35 or 40 people in the sheriff's car and trucks and things. And they went out searched by a Dixon Mound. And they f saw, it was ice but very thin, yeah. and they saw his body in, in the water, under the water and then they brought him back. This is sensational stuff, folks. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, I mean, on everybody's lips, and in 1947 there would be maybe 25 or 30 out-of-state reporters that were mm -hmm. here, because after 1946 things slowly got back to normal. Yeah. And uh, we tried him, convicted him of murder, and uh, he too 
died very soon after he was convicted up in the Joliet. Yeah, thing. it didn't didn't take long, boy. They, you know. But in here's and out. here's a case. Mm -hmm. There is no way that's a capital crime. I'm not criticizing, but well, I'm just telling it's a, you. Well, it was it's a different time. That's right. You know, you know when when you did something wrong like that. Uh, and because we had uh, two attempts in Peoria, Illinois, mm -hmm. uh, to come in and take the killer out, and the ones of Williams and Brown in 1850, mm -hmm. yeah, with a whole big group of men and boys went in and drugged these two guys out. Yeah, the lynch mob. But the and truth those things is, happened. Absolutely. Well, and, and the truth is, Brown uh, took off his pants, tied the end, and put a couple of bricks in there. And when this guy from Canton burst in, he, he killed him. Wow. And so that really, and so they drug him out and they were yeah. going to hang him. But here's exactly the reason why they didn't, and this is in the record. Nobody had a rope. That's what they said. <laughs> and I can believe that. Nobody had a rope. That's what they but said. But this is, you know, people wonder why the law is the way it is. But when you, you think about some of the things that happened and... You know, okay, he killed her in this day and age. He wouldn't be put to death yeah. for that. But back then, he was. He yeah. was a serial rapist, and Just women think, had no defense. So. Uh, they, di they didn't try him for any rape at all. None. No, none. That's none. what they had in waiting for him if this jury hung. Yeah. You know, but it was an exciting time. And, of course, I was here, I remember. Yeah, the, I yeah, mean, that was... The whole thing. And, of course, scared everybody. Yeah. And when the body is missing, scary. Yeah. yeah. We are out of time. That's amazing. Are you sure we talked a half hour? We talked half an hour. So... Wow. <laughs> I'm just going to invite everybody once again. These stories are on our website, and you can find them and read them for yourself. You and come down to the library and read them in print if you don't want to read it on the computer. And we will see you next week on Information Police.